Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to those who are joining us in person and to those who are joining us on the Zoom webinar. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, we have a really exciting Grand Rounds today, a special event. I'll just uh, give you a few announcements before we begin. So next week's Grand Rounds will be given by Stephen Kushner, MD, PhD, Professor of Psychiatry in our department and co-director of the SNF Center for Precision Psychiatry and Mental Health. And the topic of his grounds is related to that title, um, to his title. He'll be speaking about the new Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Precision Psychiatry and Mental Health in our department, which is a very exciting, brand new and newly funded initiative in our department. So I really encourage you to join us for that. Um, today's Grand Rounds is a special series. As I mentioned, it's the Hot Topic series. Um, which we've been doing for several years now. And the goal of this series is to highlight the work of uh, several junior investigators in our department to increase our exposure as a department to the exciting work of young uh, investigators in the department and to facilitate collaborations and discussion about their work. Um, for those of you who are joining us in person, we invite you to stay at the end of our session at 1230 for lunch, which will be uh, served uh, right outside of the auditorium in the lobby in the atrium. Um, and then for those who are joining us via Zoom, just a few quick notes about questions. First of all, please ask us questions. To do that, you can um, ask questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat feature. If you're a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question. We really like to prioritize trainee questions. And then lastly, we encourage Zoom webinar attendees to ask questions questions themselves. Um, if you're open to doing that, we will promote you to a panelist temporarily so that you can ask um, one of our speakers your question directly. Um, it's much more interesting than having us read your question. So please consider doing so. Um, to let us know your preference in your question, please write either can ask question myself or prefer to have question read. Okay, so the format for today, we have three very exciting speakers. We're going to hear from each of them back to back. I'll introduce them as they come up, and then we'll have a 30-minute or so Q&A um, um, with all of our speakers at the end. So our first speaker this morning is Dr. Philip Kroniski. Dr. Kroniski is an assistant professor in the Division of Gender, Sexuality, and Health with the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies here at PI and Columbia. His research concentrates on the impact of socioeconomic factors and digital technology on adolescent and young adult development in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa. He also designed and teaches the course Digital Technology and Human Development at the Heilbrunn Department of Population and Family Health in the Mailman School of Public Health. And the title of Phil's talk this morning is Suicide Among Youth Affected by HIV, Vulnerabilities and Implications for Intervention. Welcome, Dr. Kroniski. Right. Cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. Oh, cool. Thanks, Simon. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for that introduction. All right. I'll just, we're just getting a slide set up. Good to see you all here in person and on Zoom. So yeah, my name is Phil Kroniski and I'll be speaking to you today about suicide among youth affected by HIV, vulnerabilities and implications for intervention. I have no financial disclosures. So when the youth described in today's presentation were born, HIV was a death sentence. But today, HIV infection is a chronic health condition. There are about 1.7 million adolescents under 15 years living with perinatally acquired HIV, and approximately 5 million youth aged 15 to 24 are living with HIV, some of them behaviorally acquired and some of them perinatally acquired. There are also about 14.8 million children who were uh, HIV exposed but uninfected either at birth or uh, through breastfeeding. And um, I think this is one of like the great accomplishments of public health and biomedical interventions that we've been able to provide treatment uh, and prevention for mothers and children to prevent uh, greater numbers of HIV infection. 
Um, and, and it's also important to consider the context in which many of these young people are born, largely born into poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa, and typically in low-income families of color in the United States. So as you know, many of you here and on Zoom are well aware, um, living in low-income neighborhoods and growing up in poverty comes with many negative, uh, there are many negative health outcomes associated with um, these social determinants, right? And these same social determinants contribute to differences in suicidality by race and ethnicity for youth in the United States. For example, a greater proportion of Black and Latinx youth than white youth live in low-income neighborhoods where stressful life events are more common compared to middle and high-income neighborhoods. Um, and so experiencing these stressful life events uh, are, are associated with increase in attempted suicide. And stressful life events can also lead to a host of other negative developmental outcomes, including mental illness, a known predictor of attempted suicide. Racial and ethnic discrimination has also been identified as um, impacting suicide indirectly through depression symptoms. And disparities in arrests and police brutality by race and ethnicity are key indicators of systemic racism, as are many of the previously mentioned uh, stressful life events, which also have been associated with attempted suicide. In addition, sexual and gender minority and HIV status and stigma uh, have been associated with increased risk for suicide, although um, this hasn't been fully explored among young people living with HIV. <clears throat> In, in the work of, of, from colleagues uh, who've, who've uh, examined this issue among youth living with uh, perinatal infected HIV and, and exposed, there have been few, few differences have been identified in behavioral health outcomes and adult milestones. One difference we have identified is the risk of attempted suicide. And this is in line with um, other, other groups and globally when we, when we look at uh, people living with HIV, according to a recent systematic review, have a hundredfold higher risk than the general population of, uh, of suicide. So other systematic reviews have pointed to uh, the need for evidence-based suicide prevention for youth and a lack of evidence-based suicide prevention for the approximately 5 million youth living with HIV. And I think we can really look to the work of you know, colleagues here and, and across, um, you know, psychiatry departments, um, and, and most recently a systematic review of evidence-based suicide prevention by Columbia colleagues, Man et al. So there are strategies for the general population. I think we need to consider what are the unique vulnerabilities and, and points of intervention for this specific vulnerable population. And one key finding I think from this recent paper was that training general practitioners warrants wider implementation and testing. So we'll, we'll circle back to that a little bit later after we look at these uh, the findings. So in the current study, we're looking at um, youth living with perinatally acquired HIV and youth who were perinatally exposed but not infected with HIV. And we're examining first structural, sociodemographic and psychosocial factors associated with attempted suicide. And then we're gonna look at some preliminary qualitative data to think about implications for prevention and post-attempt intervention. So this work really draws heavily from uh, my mentor, Dr. Claude Mellon's uh, CASA cohort. It's a prospective cohort study in New York City youth uh, living with perinatally acquired HIV and youth who were perinatally exposed, but not infected. Enrollment mean age was 12 years, and, and the current mean age for the cohort is about 28 years. And they've been interviewed annually for the past 19 years with a psychosocial and psychiatric interview. And I'll go into a little more detail about the factors that we're looking at today in a moment. For the quantitative analyses that uh, I'll share, with the main outcome was lifetime suicide attempt. And we used the following question from the DISC to determine lifetime suicide attempt. Have you ever in your whole life tried to kill yourself or make a suicide attempt? And then we also considered sociodemographic and structural factors like gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, age, pregnancy, self or partner, arrested, spent time in jail, 
city stress inventory, negative life events and HIV status, and then psychosocial factors such as spirituality, social problem solving inventory score, Tennessee self-concept, which has multiple domains, any disc psychiatric disorder and disc substance use disorder. And then for the youth living with HIV, we additionally looked at HIV stigma. So in addition to examining descriptives, we also plotted the cumulative incidence, Kaplan-Meier of the time to first suicide attempt with the age as the x-axis. And then we employed general estimating equations to individually estimate odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals for the association between each sociodemographic contextual and psychosocial factor, factor and having a first report of attempted suicide. So binary outcome adjusting for age at each survey round. So we did this first for the overall population and then for youth who were perinatally exposed and then third for only youth who were living with perinatally acquired HIV. We also conducted uh, qualitative interviews that were supported by this um, recent OMH Policy Scholars Award. Thank you to the department for that. That added 19 qualitative interviews. And we purposively sampled CASA youth with the reported suicide attempt. These took about 45 minutes over Zoom and topics included events leading to attempt, pre-attempt experiences and interventions, if any, post-attempt journey and interventions, if any. And we used a uh, values analysis, which is a systematic approach to qualitative analysis to identify salient concepts. Uh, two coders coded all uh, excerpt, all narratives, and then a third served as a tiebreaker in, in cases when needed. I'm happy to talk more about that if people have questions later. So first I'll show you a, a table of the description of the overall cohort and the qualitative, uh, and also the qualitative interview participants. So there were no demographic differences between the two groups at enrollment in terms of the youth living with HIV and the exposed group. For the overall sample, 51% uh, were female, 72% identified as heterosexual, 60% identified as black, 50% identified as Latinx, and 11% identified as black and Latinx. Figure one shows the, cumul the Kaplan-Meier cumulative incidence estimates of first suicide attempt among adolescents and youth living with perinatally acquired HIV and adolescents and youth who were perinatally HIV exposed but uninfected. And in a, one of our earlier papers, we showed that this difference emerges around 15 years. And as you can see descriptively from this cumulative incidence of suicide attempt, it appears that the differences are widening as uh, the adolescents enter young adulthood. And, and the youth living with HIV, as you can see, consistently have higher um, cumulative incidence of suicide attempts. Table two is, shows a joint display of associations between first report of attempted suicide and sociodemographic and structural factors for the overall cohort and within youth living with HIV and the exposed subgroups and, and key excerpts. So I'll walk you through a couple of the key findings here. So in the age-adjusted model, uh, the youth living with perinatal HIV had higher odds of attempted suicide. And one excerpt that really brought this to life reads, my status is one of my triggers. For me, it's like, bro, nobody care if I die, said a Black and Latina 31-year-old living with HIV. And then for the overall and also for the young, youth living with HIV populations, those who identified as heterosexual as compared to sexual and gender minorities had lower attempts of suicide. Um, as one participant described, I just couldn't be who I wanted to be. I felt like I had to be forced to be this person, and I just didn't understand why. And this Latina, 32 years old, talks about uh, feeling conflicted about uh, ha having sexual relationships with women and also with men. So this is generally a fraught uh, area for her. And then uh, we also see that among the youth living with HIV, experiencing pregnancy was also associated with increased odds of attempted suicide. And this is a complex factor that warrants further study. But one excerpt that brought this to life is the only thing that made me depressed in the past few months was my miscarriage. I'm pause and med issues and felt like I was not worthy of being a mother, even though I know I'm like my body betrayed me. Try again. I'm scared. We also see that a lot of these structural factors like arrested, spent time in jail, negative life events, city stress inventory, were all associated with increased odds of attempted suicide. 
for the overall and the youth living with HIV groups, as was HIV stigma. So one participant wrote in terms of a recent arrest and also just the confluence of events, I felt like I was a burden. Like, so it's like this time that I did, I kind of blow up. I end up being arrested. And, and talking about all the pressures of life and family coming together and leading to this moment that contributed to their attempt. Turning to the psychosocial factors um, for the overall and the within the youth living with HIV and the exposed groups and, and a few key excerpts, uh, we see that personal self-concept and family self-concept were protective against attempted suicide for the overall and the youth living with HIV groups. Um, and, and one participant describes, there was this low point, everything I did, I just felt like a failure, said a Black and Latina 33-year-old. We also see consistent with the literature for other uh, groups that any DISC psychiatric disorder was associated with increased odds of attempted suicide across groups. So one participant described this, I have to be depressed for days before that mind state, said a Black and Latina 31-year-old living with HIV. And finally, we see with um, substance use was the only uh, factor that actually had an interaction by HIV status. And surprisingly, it was the youth exposed, but uh, not HIV negative group that had um, a, high, a much stronger association with substance disorder and, and attempted suicide. And one participant said, I just wanted to drink and smoke every day just to like cope with it, said a Latina 29-year-old. So taking a step back and just purely focusing on the qualitative, um, there are, I think there are a few further intervention implications, and these are some results from our preliminary analyses so far. So one point for pre-attempt intervention appears to be primary provider screening. So one participant said that open dialogue with my doctor really helped me out a lot. Um, she said the doctor's the one that he knew from the first, because you go to your doctor for a blood draw and, and they open up. They saw the cuts on my arms and that opened the conversation. There's also, I think, important implications for post-attempt interventions. And it's been well established that one of the greatest risks for death by suicide is a prior attempt. So I think we can learn a lot from the stories of people who've made an attempt telling us about things that have been important for them in their lives to prevent future attempts. And so when we think about post-attempt interventions, counseling came up time and again. It's helped me understand that not everyone's going to hurt me and help me understand that everything I do does not have to end with me alone, said a Latina 32-year-old. Another concrete uh, Im Im implication is this idea of, and it's been established in the literature, a set strategy, right? For when those, I guess, those thoughts kind of try to creep in, said a Black and Latina 26-year-old. Uh, and she talked about having a uh, level of people that you go to because quote, not everybody wants to start off with like, oh my gosh, I need to find a therapist right away. Sometimes just talking to a friend, it might seem silly talking to a pet, but really having a chain of command. So yeah, I have a strategy as far as if I ever get to that point, which I hopefully won't. And some participants also talked about the importance of church and spiritual based supports. So I did find a lot of comfort and, you know, just peace in the church, said a black and Latina 24 year old living with HIV. So overall, um, I think what we've identified are, are, are challenging systemic issues. Uh, and this is really one of the first examinations of sociodemographic structural and psychosocial associations with attempted suicide among youth affected by HIV. Um, we saw recent arrests, city stress, stressful life events are all key variables significantly associated with increased odds of attempted suicide. And these factors have been linked to systemic racism. I think there's also a need for future work on intersectional identities and the impact of systemic racism on suicidality. And we need to further examine associations between HIV stigma, pregnancy, and increased suicide among youth living with HIV. And broadly, right, I think this points to like cultural shifts that may be challenging, but we need to think about institutional level. How do we change these structures that are creating these vulnerabilities, right, and creating these feelings and putting the people living with HIV or affected with HIV in situations that lead to negative outcomes. Uh, I think concretely, uh, another way, another implication is we can think about partnerships with biomedical, community-based, and religious institutions. 
We need to think about possible tailoring of zero suicide initiatives and 988 that so many people at Columbia have been instrumental in, in you know, creating and establishing, but now how do we tailor it for these particularly vulnerable group uh, groups? Um, and then specifically, you know, at, thinking back to that systematic recent systematic review, training general practitioners, but, but also specifically youth practitioners and specifically HIV practitioners. So for youth living with HIV, existing connections with medical clinics may provide an opportunity to intervene and address suicidality. And we're actually looking at this in a recently funded R21 and working with the AETC, which is housed here at Columbia as well, and works with clinicians to see, can we integrate screening into care, right? What other kinds of mental health supports can we integrate into primary care or into the office visits that many youth with HIV attend? Uh, and then internationally, right, the majority of youth affected by HIV are living in sub-Saharan Africa. And there's a major initiative, the WHO mental health integration into um, primary care. And so in, in my KO1, actually in Uganda, and also working with colleagues in Kenya, we're thinking about how do we link adolescents with behavioral health care? How do we provide screening at the school level or at the primary care level um, in resource limited settings? So I think that's a really another really important direction and implications of, of some of this work in terms of potential vulnerabilities that may be uh, similar internationally. So, but in sum, uh, I think we, this work identifies unique vulnerabilities among youth affected by HIV, but we've also shown uh, existing touch points that could really facilitate intervention and, and make meaningful uh, changes to reduce the rates of attempted suicide among this population and certainly prevent future attempts. So I think there's an optimistic and, and a hopeful uh, bent to this, to these findings. Uh, so I'd like to thank my mentors, some Dr. Mellons <laughs> and uh, Remian, uh, the New York State Office of Mental Health Policy Scholars Award. Uh, thank you to the CASA participants and the whole team that's been so uh, key throughout this work. And, you know, uh, I rely on them every day for this. And uh, also Maddie Gold and Ruben Robbins and other faculty at uh, NISP in Columbia. So thank you. Bill, that was such a great talk. You really took us so deeply into that story in just 18 minutes. That's really impressive. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our next uh, three speakers for today, um, Dr. Monica Kim. Dr. Kim is a T32 postdoctoral fellow in the Late Life Disorders Research Program here in our department. Um, and it sounds like maybe about to receive a K award um, and join our faculty shortly. Um, Dr. Kim earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Boston University after completing internship at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medicine. Her research interests focus primarily on identifying and targeting modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. She has particularly been interested in examining the role of sleep and sleep disorders as ways to reduce Alzheimer's disease risks. And the title of her talk is Sleep Interventions to Enhance Cognition and Reduce Alzheimer's Disease Risk in Older Adults. Thank you for speaking, Monica. Welcome. Thank you for your introduction. I'll just set up the laser point quickly, okay. So I'll start off by talking about and potentially convincing you that poor sleep is a modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And then I'll move on to discussing how we may be able to use sleep interventions as potential preventative tool um, against Alzheimer's disease. And I'll finish the presentation by discussing some future directions for the um, current or recently funded case study and also other sleep, cool sleep related research. All right, so um, dementia is this large umbrella term describing syndrome associated with um, impairments in cognition, behavioral changes, and impairment in ability to perform daily activities. And it's a debilitating, um, it has a debil debilitating impact psychologically, physically, and in terms of the ability to perform daily activities. It's a major cause of disability and dependency in older adults in the U.S. And Alzheimer's disease um, is makes up the majority of dementia cases and is estimated to be um, about 60 to 80% of all dementia cases. 
currently affecting about 6 million older adults in the US, and this number is expected to increase by 18% by 2025, making this a true um, global public health concern. And compared with normal course of aging, the continuum of Alzheimer's disease is marked by this red curve over here, um, characterized by more rapid decline in cognition with advancing age. And because Alzheimer's disease has an insidious onset with many years of preclinical stages, that might be a good target window to pre um, prevent the onset. And I would like us to pay more special attention to this stage right here, mild cognitive impairment. I'll refer to it as MCI. Um, because this at state at this stage, older adults with MCI exhibit some cognitive impairment with preservation of daily performance. And it's important to note this stage because the majority of them go on to developing dementia with the annual conversion rate of about 15 to 20 percent. So if we're able to intervene early on before at an MCI stage, we may be able to delay the onset of dementia or Alzheimer's disease by a few years. And if we're successful enough, we may even be able to pre prevent it um, over the course of one's lifetime. And with current limitations on pharma pharmacologicals of treatment for Alzheimer's disease, such as modest treatment um, effect sizes or difficulty accessing these medications, a lot of focus has been paid attention to um, targeting modifiable risk factors, which include um, smoking, um, high blood pressure, physical inactivity, al along with depression, diabetes, um, and obesity. And meta-analyses conducted by Barnes and Yaffe indicated that targeting these modifiable risk factors could prevent the onset of Alzheimer's disease almost by half, um, and that's a lot. And although sleep disturbance did not make it into one of the official lists of modifiable risk factors, meta-analyses conducted by Bubu and colleagues indicated that as many as 15% of AD cases are attrib attributable to sleep disturbance. And why else should we care about sleep? It turns out that we're very interested in sleep, maybe because one, we're not getting enough of it, or maybe we're not doing a very good job of it. And as science is telling us more about why sleep is really important for the brain and the body. And unfortunately, as this um, article says over here, um, sleep does become worse with the aging um, process. So that's another reason why we want to pay attention to sleep um, with the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. So sleep is very important for the brain for multiple reasons. Um, it has this restorative and regeneration process, and it regulates cellular functions, regulates hormonal changes, and brain oxygenation during sleep is very important for our cerebrovascular health. And recently, there has been this huge attention to sleep's role in clearance of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, such as amyloid beta and tau proteins. Cognitively, sleep is very important for what we would call the frontal network functioning, such as attention, target detection, and executive function. And there is this sleep stage dependent memory consolidation um, with particular focus on the slow wave sleep. So slow wave sleep is characterized by these large amplitudes of brain waves known as delta waves or slow wave activity during sleep. And it serves various crucial roles in the brain, including tissue restoration and is a key player of the clearance of amyloid. And there, and slow wave sleep is involved in this memory consolidation process, the reprocessing of encoded information. So transferring from short-term hippocampal storage to long-term neocortical storage. And with aging, a lot of these change, especially in the sleep architecture. So what you see here in the dark blue bar over here represents slow wave sleep. And you'll notice that compared to a 20 year old or 45 year old and a 70 year old, slow wave sleep decreases across the, um, with advancing age. And what happens is that the lighter sleep stages such as stages one and two sleep in the lighter colors tend to increase with advancing age. And symptomatically what happens to sleep is that older adults experience increased um, sleep fragmentation. So waking up multiple times throughout the night and the advancement of their circadian cycle. So, you know, waking up early in the morning and Old, um, advancing age is also associated with some medical comorbidities that might get in the way of getting a good night's sleep. 
So currently, it is estimated that about 30 to 48 percent of adults age 60 and over are suffering from sleep disorders and um, in insomnia in particular. So during my fellowship here at Columbia, I've been really focused on um, examining some of the large scale data sets, such as the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and wanted to explore the interaction between sleep amyloid on the brain health. So what we see here in this figure is that if somebody has this informant reported sleep disturbance um, and have amyloid positivity at baseline, that was predictive of a faster decline in cognitive performance over the course of five years. And particularly in this example, it's executive function. And this trend was similar for um, the rate of brain atrophy, particularly in some of the regions like the inter interrhinal cortex. And when we conducted a similar set of anal analyses in the same data set um, in older adults across all cognitive stages, we found that having sleep disturbance and amyloid beta was associated with this hyperconnectivity in the resting state functional connectivity, particularly in the salience network. And the salience network is important to understand because this hyperconnectivity has been associated with advancing um, Alzheimer's pathology. So, and what was also very interesting about this study was that sleep itself was not associated with this aberrant activity, but it was with a combination of amyloid that we saw this exacerbation of this abnormal connectivity in the brain. And the last study that I'll introduce is um, looking at another large scale data set, the Human Connectum Project. And we were interested in looking at how what role age plays in the relationship between sleep and cognition. So what we see here is um, the relationship between sleep quality and cognitive performance, and namely trails B performance and executive functioning measure um, changes with um, age across age. So what we find from here is that not all everybody in this adult group is impacted in the same way, but what seems to be um, there is a, this critical age range between 50 to 75 that seems to be more vulnerable to sleep-related cognitive decline. So these three studies um, that I conducted here at Columbia um, seem to point to the importance of identifying risk, which is sleep disturbance, and also examining some of the interactions that it might play neurobiologically to give more meaningful onset to brain health outcome. And during my work here and during my grad school work, um, what I've established is conceptual framework that be became a backbone of my K23 study. So sleep disturbance in the form of decreased sleep continuity, depth and stability could lead to decreased um, performance in attention executive function through changes in tissue restoration and cortical atrophy leading to Alzheimer's disease. Another mainstream cascade that I've identified is also that sleep disturbance could increase these neurotoxins associated with Alzheimer's disease leading to a decline in memory and leading to the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Of course, it's not that simple and there's more interactions and there are predisposing factors such as old age and genetic predisposition such as APOE. So looking at this framework, it, I can't help but wonder, well, then what if we target sleep disturbance? What if we reduce sleep disturbance, make sleep better? Maybe that could lead to the cascade of reduction in neurotoxins, increasing cognition, and therefore, um, later onset of Alzheimer's disease or prevention. And with that came my research question for the K23. Um, so here I'm um, interested in exploring these two novel sleep interventions. So one is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, and the other is called the acoustic slow wave activity enhancement. I'll call that sway. And the, one of the main aim is to differentiate the neurobiological mechanisms um, of co neurocognitive correlates of these two sleep interventions. So CBTI is a first liner supplement uh, to treatment for insomnia, and it includes some components like controlling the sleep environment and related stimuli, scheduling sleep time, sleep hygiene, and so on. It's shown superior long-term benefits compared to sleep aids like benzodiazepines. And a pilot study conducted at Stanford indicated that in individuals with MCI, CBTI could improve executive function, but not memory. 
Another intervention here is a headband. So we'll be using a dream headband. What it does is that when it detects this slow wave activity during sleep um, through the electrodes, it plays this acoustic pulses, pink noises, which generate the um, endogenous slow wave. So what it does is it amplifies the slow waves that you're body generates. Um, and the pilot study conducted at Northwestern in, indicated that increases in slow wave activity during sleep through this headband was associated with increase in word recall in a group of older adults. So these pilot studies really guide the way to think maybe these interventions could be used um, in MCI populations to enhance their brain and cognitive health. So I've conducted preliminary study here. Um, in eight adults, four in each group. And each group, so one group received both treatment, CBTI and Sway, and the other group was a complete um, control and sham group. Um, mean age was about 70, all female, because we excluded sleep apnea, but that was resolved later, and I can talk about that more. And the outcome was um, the neuropsychological test battery called a no practice effect battery developed by my mentor, Terry Goldberg. And it shows reduced practice effect as the name implies, and it has enhanced psychometric um, properties. So what results show here is that individuals who receive both treatments in orange over here um, reported reduction of insomnia severity um, pre to post treatment and increase in slow wave sleep pre to post treatment. Cognitively, their performance and attention and working memory um, were better, and there was also cognitive benefits around memory in the treatment group. And it seemed like there were some association between positive associations between changes in insomnia and attention measures, and also there were some detectable changes, uh, associations between um, slow wave sleep and memory performance. So although the effect sizes are a little bit inflated with a small sample size. This data really, you know, got me some signals and detectable signals to conduct the main study. So for the main study, I'll be doing very similar work, but this time the two group treatment groups will be either CBTI or Sway. 25 participants will be assigned to each group and they will go through eight weeks of treatment. So my hypothesis is that CBTI will be will have show cognitive benefits on attention, target detection, and executive functioning, mediated by changes in these sleep um, metrics, such as total sleep time, sleep efficiency, and sleep duration. And I also hypothesize that sway will be associated with memory performance, mediated by increases in slow wave sleep indices. As an exploratory analysis, um, I'm also going to measure plasma AD biomarkers, namely phospho phosphorylated tau 181, um, and see whether AD biomarkers change um, with post-treatment. And this study will be a six-month study, so uh, participants will be coming in at baseline, go through eight weeks of treatment, be tested again for sleep cognition and peak tau at post-treatment, come back to see um, in six months to see if there are any long-term benefits or changes. And some future directions, um, of course, I will. I want to successfully finish my K um, and also expand these findings to uh, for a bigger study such as the K um, as R studies. And I I'm hoping to include cognitively normal individuals um, because the K main study will be focusing on individuals with MCI. I'm interested in looking at different treatment combination, including the placebo group, um, really for the enhancement of precision medicine, targeting um, the right people at the right time. And, um, and I think identifying that window would be important. And of course, I'm interested in div um, including diverse sample populations, and hopefully we can uh, make this and disseminate the treatment um, for a larger population. And aside from that, I'm also working on a project that investigates what is so bad about long sleep, because what we know about sleep duration is that too little or too much sleep is bad, which is counterintuitive. The more sleep you get, the better you should be, right? But um, literature doesn't say that long sleep is associated with worse um, brain outcomes. So I'm investigating that using um, a Korean epidemiological data, and I'm going to continue working on looking at the interaction of AD biomarkers and sleep. 
And lastly, I would like to thank my primary mentor, Terry Goldberg, um, and Dr. Devanand, the director of Memory Disorder Center, along with my T32 directors, Drs. Roos and Brown, along with my collaborators and mentors. I would like to really thank my wonderful RAs um, for their um, help with the projects. Um, and thank you so much. I would love to talk more during our discussion. Thank you, Monica. That was a wonderful talk. Oh, I think I just saw like an emoji floating, a, a clapping emoji on the Zoom. Um, okay, great. I'm going to leave that puppy up while I introduce our final speaker. Um, our final speaker today is Dr. Daron Amsalam. Dr. Amsalam is a child and adolescent psychiatrist who is an assistant professor and research scientist in our department. He completed medical school and residency training in Israel and joined our department in 2020. His research focus is stigma reduction, specifically in the areas of psychosis and depression. Currently, he investigates interventions to reduce stigma and enhance treatment engagement in youth. He is interested in developing and, developing and implementing brief videos aiming to direct at-risk at youth into treatment earlier in the course of mental illness. And the title of his talk with us today is Brief Video Intervention to Reduce Public Stigma Toward People with Psychosis. Thank you, Daron. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, brief videos in general have been uh, uh, viewed by billions every day um, and often have a profound impact on the viewers. Video makes us uh, happy or anxious, uh, laughing or scared, and can affect the way uh, what we eat or buy. In other words, um, brief video influence emotions and behavior. My research interest is to understand how to develop brief videos um, that can help people with mental illness. Today, I'll be focusing how, on how brief video can reduce public stigma toward people with uh, psychosis. Um, here is my uh, grant uh, disclosure. Before I start, I would like to thank my mentor, uh, Lisa Dixon, my primary mentor who helps me turn uh, ideas into actions. Yuval Neria for uh, opening doors and providing advice. Um, John Markovich who tolerates me weekly for clinical and research supervision and my other um, wonderful mentors. Let's talk about stigma. Stigma is a label that is linked to negative stereotype or negative traits. There are several kinds of stigma, and I'll focus on public stigma, which involve pervasive negative attitudes and beliefs that lead society to reject people with mental illness. Why is it important? Because studies show that seven out of 10 people with severe mental illness are not treated. While access to care and availability of services are important reasons, uh, stigma also plays a significant role. So let's talk about how to reduce stigma. Overall, narratives are effective in reducing stigma, but it's a double-edged sword as it might increase stigma as well. So here is a few principles for reducing stigma. One, person-centered language is essential. Um, for example, say a person living with schizophrenia instead of schizophrenic person. Two, emphasizing solution um, seems to reduce stigma. Three, uh, common sense approach of backfired. For example, research show that comparing depression to a chronic disease like diabetes decreases hope for recovery. Four, using sympathetic narratives, story that humanize people may reduce stigma if they include certain elements. An example for such elements can be a balance between symptoms and recovery themes. Uh, five, highlighting external reasons uh, to the person condition. And six, uh, remembering that emphasizing violence drive up uh, stigma. So what do we know and what is the knowledge gap? Um, interpersonal con contact with uh, uh, a person with lived experience reduces stigma. And most studies show that video intervention have a similar um, efficacy to in-person intervention while being simpler to replicate and easier uh, to disseminate to a large population. 
However, existing video intervention lasts 24 minutes on average, uh, which uh, limits the scalability of the videos. Um, which, what leads us to the main question of uh, uh, my studies and my talk today, can brief video intervention reduce stigma? A bit about the methods uh, we used in our study. Crowdsourcing platforms um, are a cost-effective way to reduce people. We used Amazon Mechanical Turk and Prolific to recruit participants ages 18 to 30, as we focused on uh, young adults. We used the following uh, stigma domain to assess public perception about people with uh, schizophrenia or psychosis. Social distance is about uh, the willingness of someone to be a friend or a neighbor um, of a person with schizophrenia. Stereotyping um, includes item about how able is the person with schizophrenia to make their own decision about their treatment. Uh, separateness is how different do you think a person with schizophrenia is from other people? Social restriction, whether we should ban people with schizophrenia from getting married or having kids. Um, perceived recovery, if people with schizophrenia can get better. In our first study, um, we edited an existing 11 minutes video to a 90 second video. The video presented a, um, a woman uh, with schizophrenia describing her struggles in recovery. Uh, we recruited 1,200 people. Half of them um, watched the video. About three of them read the video script and the other received no intervention. Um, let's watch a short section of that video. Every day is a battle, I'm not gonna lie to you. Every day is hard because it's not easy going outside, taking the train, being around people, providing customer service when you think the world is just out to get you. Now I understand that that's part of my illness and that's not my reality. So we found that the video group, as you can see, uh, had the lowest, the lowest level of stigma throughout the five domains, while the written vignette uh, group showed less stigma than the control group. However, we had no baseline assessment or follow-up, uh, so we conducted a second study which aimed to improve the methodology. Um, while using the same interventions, we added baseline um, assessment and 30-day follow-up assessment. And moving forward, um, all of our study followed similar design in terms of time points. And so you can see the five, uh, the five graphs for each of the stigma domain. The green line represent uh, the video group. You can see a sharp reduction um, in stigma across scales after watching the video. And despite a slight rebound, there is still significant effect by day 30. The vignette, which is represented by the orange line, um, did show some effect post-intervention, but with no sustainability over time. So I hope that by now I was able to convince you that a brief video reduces stigma, um, but how does it work? We assume that the mechanism of action is identification and emotional engagement with the protagonist. Um, a secondary analysis of our studies showed a greater reduction in stigma among participants who share the same demographics. So race and gender might be a possible moderators. So to learn about the role of gender and race, we recruited uh, nearly 2000 people uh, to five arms, four video arms um, and one control. The video included uh, four different protagonists sharing their personal story of psychosis, differing in race and gender. Beyond covering a wider spectrum of presenters, we were interested to learn um, whether matching the protagonist's gender and race to the viewers increases the intervention effect. So what did we learn? As you can see by the overlapping lines across all the graphs, all video were similarly effective across all domains and were more effective than control in reducing stigma. We found no differences in stigma scores by protagonist gender or race and no greater reduction in stigma when matching the race, gender, or gender to the protagonist of the protagonist to the participant. 
Um, we were a bit surprised by that, as we assumed that shared demographic characteristic um, would enhance identification um, and emotional engagement. So we did a bit, a bit of thinking and realized that in order to maintain the uniformity of the video content, we strip unique, unique aspects of each of the presenter narrative. Aspects as gender specific inferences or cultural background, um, this might have an impact on, on the ability to identify and emotionally connect with the video presenter. Um, so the next step was to test the effect of tailoring the video to gender experiences. Um, we assume that focusing on uh, women experiences would enhance identification among women viewers. We recruited um, nearly 1,200 people and randomized them into um, generic video group with no mention of gender experiences to a gender related uh, video group with a section on gender experiences and control and a control group. Both video were presented by the same person. Let's watch a short section from the gender related video. People are usually surprised that I'm a woman uh, experiencing psychosis. The, the perception is usually um, men who are experiencing psychosis. When I was a teenager, I was actually sent to a substance use center because um, they didn't believe me that I wasn't taking any substances. They definitely didn't hear me out. And I know that that often happens with women in any kind of healthcare setting. It is very hard to live with schizophrenia, but I believe it is harder to live as a woman with schizophrenia. First, you can see here that both video reduces stigma in a similar pattern um, to our previous study. And overall, we didn't see any difference between, between the videos. However, when we took a closer look into the gender related video group, we found that in three of the five stigma domains, social distance, stereotyping and separateness, women showed a greater reduction in stigma, uh, which did not happen in the generic video and control groups. Similarly, we tailored the video to race experiences. We conducted two focus group of a young uh, black people living with psychosis. And based on the themes we found, we wrote two scripts. A professional actor uh, presented the story of a black person living with schizophrenia, once with no mention of race, that the generic video, and once with um, race related experiences, right? That's the race related video. Um, a third group included no intervention control. We oversampled black participants to allow comparison of black uh, versus non-black respondents. And we also added a new measure of emotional engagement. First, looking at all three groups, we were happy to see the overall effect of stigma reduction in this sample as well. We didn't see any differences between the videos. Um, for the new measure of emotional engagement, when we looked at differences by race in the generic um, and race-related video groups, we noticed that while we see no difference um, in the generic video groups, black individuals show a greater uh, emotional engagement with the video protagonist in the race-related video. And finally, um, and similarly to what we've, we've seen in the gender study, when we looked at into the race-related video, um, we found that in four of the five stigma skills, Black individuals showed a greater reduction in stigma, which did not happen in the generic video and the control groups. So after understanding a little bit about how to reduce uh, stigma, public stigma towards psychosis, we extended the use of the videos to other mental illnesses. We tested whether the videos could reduce depression stigma um, among adolescents and increase their intention to seek treatment if needed. Um, after a study that showed the overall efficacy of such videos, we found that brief videos were effective in reducing transphobia uh, among adolescents. Um, we had uh, transgender presenters for that study. Another study tested the efficacy 
uh, of a short video tailored to the experiences of black girls with depression. In a different line of studies, uh, we tested the efficacy of a brief video to increase the openness of essential workers to seek help. Essential workers has a, had a disturbing rates of depression and anxiety during the COVID. Um, and we conducted several studies about that. Um, a little bit about some real uh, world usage. Last year, we uploaded uh, one of the videos from our study on essential workers to the New York Project Hope website. Uh, which now has more than 100,000 views. Uh, we also launched a new homepage to uh, Ontrack New York uh, website, focusing on brief videos of personal story of Ontrack participants. A little bit about our uh, next steps. In, in, in terms of next steps, we would, we would like to learn about how this video uh, works and for whom. There are several factors um, to explore, or in other words, uh, widen our understanding of mediation of and moderation of the videos. In addition, we would like to apply the video to social media. Many people consume their preferred contact on social media platforms, uh, particularly young people. As a first step toward applying videos in social media, we tested whether the video style matters. We found that um, a low budget selfie style video is as effective as a traditional video filmed with lighting, sound, and editing. Uh, we then showed that a 60 second video uh, could be as effective as 100 second video. It's important because Instagram and TikTok limit in some cases the video length to one minute. Um, and next, we would like to test actual engagement, views, likes, shares, comments, and see how that engagement can drive higher exposure. Uh, and most importantly, whether videos contribute to bringing people um, in need into care. Thank you very much.